The ERMAC Centre is proud to present the SFU Canada Research Chairs Seminar Series. This bi-weekly series hosts five presentations this semester. For the Fall 2010 semester, the presenters belong to the Department of Mathematics, Physics, Sociology and Anthropology, the School of Interactive Arts and Technology, and the Faculty of Education. Today's speaker is Dr. Philip H. Winnie, Canada Research Chair in Self-Regulated Learning and Learning Technologies from the Faculty of Education. Uh, welcome to today's uh, session of uh, uh, Canada Research Chair Seminar Series. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Chris Magnussen, the uh, Dean of Faculty of Education, to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, it is my pleasure uh, to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Phil Winnie. He's the Canada Research Chair in Self-Regulated Learning and Learning Technologies in the Faculty of Education. Um, if you ask questions like, how do learners learn how to learn? What does it mean to be a self-regulated learner? What mechanisms might promote self-regulated learning? And how do we measure such things? I'm, I'm, I'm translating into my own uh, language, the work that, that Phil does. How might we measure learning that happens in collaborative and computer environments? How might we better understand social aspects of self-regulated learning? Well, these are a few of the questions that have captured uh, Phil's attention over the last maybe couple of years, because that's just going back to the publication list from, from about 2008 to get some of those, those titles. Some of the formal stuff that you should, you should know about uh, from Phil. Well, he, he joined us in 1975, and he's proof that ABDs work. He completed his uh, doctoral studies at Stanford in 1976, uh, and he's been with us as a, as a loyal researcher and colleague ever since. Um, he does focus on metacognition and self-regulated learning, and specifically how students monitor uh, qualities of study tactics that they use and how they use those evaluations to adapt old tactics and invent new ones. Uh, he's in, involved in developing state-of-the-art software. Uh, N-Study is a, currently a, one of the large projects that's occupying a lot of his attention. Um, and as students use the software and engage in study, the software collects detailed information about what they're doing and, and how they're tracking through this. Over the time that he's been with us, he's drawn in uh, over $9 million in research grants. Uh, he has over 140 publications in books and journals, refereed proceedings, uh, over 200 and some conference presentations. He's been elected as a fellow of the American Educational Research Association, the American Psychological Association, the Association for Psychological Science, and the Canadian Psychological Association. Uh, he's a past president of the Canadian Educational Researchers Association, uh, the Canadian Association for Educational Psychology, and Division 15 Educational Psychology of the American Psychological Association. Co-editor of several handbooks, editor of several journals. We could go on and on and on. And I have. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but you get the idea that Phil is quite the prolific scholar, uh, so much so that in a, a recent review done in 2009, I believe it was, uh, from the Contemporary Educational Psychology, uh, Phil was named as one of the 20 most productive researchers in the world in the field of educational psychology, and just a remarkable uh, lifelong achievement. So keen, tenacious, perceptive, and collaborative are words I would use to describe Phil. Relevant, focused, thorough, precise, and cumulative are some of the words I would use to describe his research. So colleagues, I'd ask you to please join me in welcoming Dr. Phil Winnie. Thank you very much, Chris. Well, I'm uh, astonished that you're here. Uh, I almost didn't get here, but I left early enough that it only took me an hour and a half. Usually it's about a 25 minute drive, but anyway, we made it. Uh, the point that I wanna make for this research really comes toward the end, but like a classical scholar, I want to build up to it. So I'm gonna take you through a variety of things, some of which may be utterly new, some of which may be a bit mysterious. Uh, I'm hoping to make some different contacts 
uh, to different interests that you may have. So, if this works, yes, okay, I want to begin with, uh, Roddy Rodiger is one of the most eminent cognitive psychologists on the planet. And in a recent annual psychology review paper, he wrote this. The aim of this review has been to remind us of the quest for laws and the difficulty in achieving them. The most fundamental principle of learning and memory, perhaps its only sort of general law, is that making any generalization about memory, one must add that it depends. And this is a problem that we face in education. Every teacher, every student, every author, every curriculum developer, every lab designer, it's all individual. How can we address this? Well, laws of learning, I think, are slippery um, because we have to deal with two elements. One is the way things are. These are psychological phenomena, the kinds of laws that Rodeker just described as being it depends. There are some that are pretty acceptable and reliable, but we still have to wrestle with this it depends. And we do because there's this other set of phenomena about the way learners make things. They're agents in the ways that they learn. They set the ways in which they work on tasks, make adaptations, redefine tasks, and so forth. And so uh, my colleague John Nesbitt and I, in uh, another chapter in this annual review of psychology, wrote that the psychology of academic achievement really has to find ways to grapple with both of these features, a science that's got regular, reliable laws and the individuality of the people who are working as learners and teachers and authors and so forth in education. But we've been hampered, and I'm going to suggest even misled by the classical paradigm of experimentation, and particularly the statistical approach we've used in that paradigm, and I'm going to try to unravel that today. And I also want to talk about ways in which I think we can improve the research by rethinking a little bit of this paradigm in ways that embrace the individuality that we are as learners and teachers and incorporating it into our research. So I want to expand the paradigm, and I want to do that by acknowledging what I call self-regulated learning. And I'll go through that, what I think that is. I also want to talk about kinds of data that we can gather that reflect self-regulated learning and ways that we can analyze those data. And then I want to try suggesting ways in which we can augment the paradigm for educational research, massively expanding the database integrating learners into the loop of research, scaffolding knowledge and schemas for learners, and motivating everyday academic work. So first, I want to give you a tour of this software because it's going to be the fulcrum on which all of these several levers are going to pivot. So first, it's a web application. This means it's software that runs on a server, but you see it running in a web browser. Firefox is the one that we've keyed it to. It's not a tutor or in any other sense a directly instructional system. Interventions would have to come from somewhere else. They could come from face-to-face -face instruction. They could come from formatted web pages where you're giving learners instructions about ways to learn or particular kinds of information to address. It could come from other resources on the internet or it could come from structured participation, either mediated through the internet or in face-to-face -face groups like in problem-based learning. What NStudy does that's a, not completely unique, but a bit unique in the, in, what, in the particulars that it does, is it gathers extensive data about what learners are doing at the time that they're doing it. And it records very low level events like windows opening and closing and buttons being clicked, the kinds of things that geeks are interested in. It also can identify which units of information a learner is operating on. And I'll show you a little bit of that in a moment. For instance, when you highlight something, it records not only that you have highlighted, but what text you highlighted. It can characterize the context of operations because each of these data are recorded in a time-sequenced, time-stamped log. So we can look previously to any particular event to determine what the context for that event was. We get the onset time of events, and also since the onset of a second event signals the offset of a prior event, we can measure durations. So we can get psychological information like latencies, which are important for some kinds of questions that people address. And we also get various kinds of metadata. So for example, when you create a note, I know that you authored the note, when you authored it. And because we have uh, some social features in the system, if I edit the note, it's recorded that I edited it, and at the time at which I did that. So we have a kind of running record about what happens to these so-called information objects. Here's a picture of the browser window in NStudy. 
And uh, so here we are running in Firefox. We have a kind of elaborated table of contents over in this area. So for example, you can tag information. So there's uh, a tag called can do, another one called can't do. And every time you tag some information, this uh, quote is recorded. And it's kept for you over here on the side. You can fold this up like a folder in some kinds of operating systems or other interfaces. Um, and the way you make a tag is that you select some text and you pop up this menu using a control key and make your selection tag. Here we happen to have a list of the five most recent tags used. And once you've selected the tag, it's done. It gets posted over here and recorded in the log. You can highlight various things. And you can make notes or create terms, again, by selecting some text over here, picking link to new note or link to new term, and doing that. And uh, one of the things that NStudy does that, as far as I know, is unique is it surveys each web page that you have open to identify any terms that you'd previously created that appear in that web page. So you have a completely contextual, instantaneous glossary record, if you will, of what's happening there. Um, one of the other things here, you can double click on any of these kinds of items and open up a window that shows you those. So for example, here's a note. And uh, it happens to use a basic form. Again, we have this sort of elaborated table of contents over here showing links that this note happens to have to a bookmark in the internet, a couple of terms, modern biology, cell theory, and so forth, and another note. And one of the other important features about NStudy is that it allows learners to interlink information as richly and complexly or as little as they wish. Um, the software surveys terms that appear here in the description, or here in the quote, or here in the title. So again, you have an instantaneous gl uh, glossary record of what this node is using in terms of the basic building blocks of the discipline. Um, notes have forms, uh, literally web forms, templates, schemas, depending on your orientation, your vocabulary. Um, and what you can do is you can build forms. So here's one that's got a, uh, the title, the, here's where you select the form, Here's the quote, the information you selected in the browser that this note refers to. Um, here's a thing called rich text, and it's just got some information. You can change this label by going over here, picking this, dragging it over there, typing in the words that you want, and uh, creating your own web form on the fly. Uh, and so here, this has happened. We've added a rich text field about what do you think. And when you save this note and then open it up again, rich text will go away and you'll see, what do you think? And there'll be a prompt for you to in enter information like that. Instructors can create them for, for the, themselves, these kinds of forms. So you can create a, a lab entry form, a, a data entry form, an argument form. When learners create forms like this, that's prima facie evidence that they're regulating learning. What they're saying is, that basic form you started out with, not sufficient for me. I've got some other important qualities I want to describe about the information I'm taking notes about. I'm going to create my own form. Very high level cognitive engagement and direct evidence that people have, as I would say, metacognitively monitored that what they started with wasn't adequate. They want to make an adjustment. Here's a term, the way in which you create those glossary entries. Uh, same kind of format as a note, has a title. Um, enter that in here. Here's the quote where you identified information in the browser. You don't have to have a quote. You can make a term all by itself. Here's the term itself. And again, this elaborated table of contents showing you a little bit of the metadata right here. Um, we created a graphical display that shows glossary entries for all of the windows that you have open. So this is one for three windows that are open. And it shows you the terms, Doppler effect, redshift, and so forth, and the links that have been created across those terms. Some links are created by learners, but NStudy has a special relational operator. It says, whenever the definition of one term uses another term in your glossary, make a link between those two things. It's the dictionary game. You look up a definition and you say, oh, I don't quite understand what that means because I don't know what this word means. Well, what we've done is created an opportunity for learners to go back and forth that way across all the new terms that they're acquiring in their discipline. You might think, well, this might not be such a big deal. But my favorite example of why I think this is necessary is an introductory biology textbook I have on my shelf. 
after I've worked out so that I can actually lift this 800-page tome, if you look in the back, it has over 800 new vocabulary words that are unique to biology. Not one of those words appears in normal English conversation at the coffee shop. So when you're studying, you get a chance to see, well, if I'm looking, at, for example, at mutation, I haven't linked that with anything, and it isn't linked with anything else. If I understand things by making connections, I'd better find something that I can link that to. This picture prompts thinking like that, which creates opportunities for learners to regulate their learning. We also have what in education we call concept maps, or knowledge maps, or mind maps, a couple of different words for this. Learners can create these from scratch, or in any window, for example, one of those browser windows, there's a map it button. And when you click it, all of the notes and terms that you've created in that browser window are instantaneously popped onto this kind of graphical display. And here the learner can group things together, can make her own links, or in some cases about terms, those links are automatically made by the software. And you've got here a table of contents of what you're visualizing over here. If you get two or 300 nodes in one of these maps, it's very difficult to find where it is. You can find it alphabetically over here, click on it, scrolls to that place in the map, find your way around. Here's a document. A favorite dependent variable in psychological studies and education studies is free recall. Tell me everything you can remember about what you've just studied. So we have a rich text editor so that people can do that. But in other contexts, for example, if this were being used in a course like a biology lab, people could write their lab reports here. And it's got enough features. It's not a complete Microsoft Word, but it's got styles and other sorts of features that you might want to use in creating that kind of a report. Again, it's all of the terms that happen to appear in this document are classified for you over here. And links that between this document and other things like a note and a bookmark are provided. And you can tag the document in any way that you wish. Here's a library. After you've created all these notes and terms and concept maps and documents and so forth, how do you find them again? So this is our version of the old paper version card catalog, or what we now do electronically. So here we find a list of just a few things that are being shown in the library. They're selected by, for example, things that are tagged can't do, funny, important, or read so that you can filter things that are in the library. Um, you can operate on some of the things in the library. So if you want to tag something here, you can pick that. If you want to link it to some other note, you can pick that. Um, and you can modify some of these columns to describe what you're looking for in the library. And by clicking on a column head, it sorts it alphabetically or by date, whatever the kind of column information is. Here's a larger picture of the library with more kinds of information in it showing you the variety of what we call information objects with which people can work in and study. So you can work with bookmarks, chats, documents, files, forms, maps, notes, tags, and terms. And uh, you have a search field here if you say, you know, I think I made a note a couple of weeks ago that happened to have a, this particular word in it, but I can't find it. So you can put that into the search box right up here, and it will filter all of this information just so you can find that. Some other features, we have a chat tool so that people can work collaboratively. One of the features of our chat tool is that it has two drop-down lists. One of them says, what role do you want to adopt in this collaborative work that you're doing? You want to, are you the manager? Are you the evidence provider? Are you the fact checker, etc.? And because what research tells us that people don't know how to collaborate very well, we give them some prompts so that if you are the manager, what, do you, what are the kinds of things that you say to your collaborators? So you can get some ideas about what you might do in a particular role that you adopt or are assigned by pulling down one of these other menus and clicking on it. And when you do that, it copies that text directly into your text entry box so that you can, if you're, for instance, the fact checker and you want to say, what's your evidence for? You don't have to constantly type that. It's just immediately provided for you. And all you do is fill in the object of that preposition for. We also have various workspaces. You can have a private workspace that's utterly yours. And you can have a shared workspace in which you and your collaborators have, as they say, equal privileges. You can put a note into this shared workspace, and I can destroy it. I can edit it. When I edit it, a record is made that I edited it, when I edited it. And you can find out who's been editing my notes. It creates an opportunity to collaborate with everyone as if they're your siblings, although I don't know if that's a great way to put it, because sometimes siblings don't work well together. And there are administrator tools. OK, so let me move now to extending the paradigm. I want to ask, what generates learning? What are sources of variance? 
And why are true experiments of the kind that we run in the lab or randomized controlled trials that we run in the field, where are these, where are these leading us astray? So there, this is a simple picture of how learning happens. There are features of instructional designs. Headings in textbook are a feature of instructional design. Pounding on the board to make emphasize a point is a feature of instructional design. Italic font is a feature of instructional design. A series of questions that you ask to draw out information from students is a feature of instructional design. Every one of these features of instructional design is designed to bring the learner to engage in some particular kinds of cognitive operations. What's going on in here? I can find my button. There we go. And because I uh, kind of wanted to play a little game here, this is my homunculus in the black box here. Um, but these features of instructional design occur in a context of states of mind. Everything that's out there in the environment isn't what's in here. People have limited perception and limited attention. They also have unique constructions of knowledge and motives and values and interests and so forth. And those things are parts of what get input to this instantaneous cognitive activity that generates information or knowledge or skills. Just quickly, why do I separate information from knowledge? Knowledge is something that you can remember. Information is something you know for the moment but may not be able to retain. So what's going on inside that black box? When I point up here, when I emphasize with my arms, what's going on? And what I want to do is um, talk about operations that get applied to information. And I'm going to use this little symbolic representation rather than all those words, just because I don't have enough space on these PowerPoint slides. So when you see this, it means some particular operation is applied to some particular bit of information, like the text that I highlight in the browser. Talk about self-regulated learning. Alison Hadwin, who is a PhD student here, now an associate professor at the University of Victoria, and I published a paper in 1998, laid out a model that we have, four weekly sequenced and recursive phases. Weekly sequenced means that people don't have to start at number one, and if they're at number three, they can go back to number one or jump to number four. Recursive means that information generated in one stage is input to a subsequent stage, whatever stage it happens to be. First one is defining the task. When people are given assignments, they define the task. We all know that when you say you have a term paper to write, there are lots of questions that come out. What the students are trying to do is figuring out what the dimensions are of that task. Given that the task has been somewhat defined, people set goals, and having set goals, they think about ways in which they can reach those goals. Sometimes this happens so fast we don't even notice it. We call it automation. And this happens because we've had such extensive experience with uh, activities. When I try to balance my checkbook, I don't have to think about what I'm doing. I've been doing this for decades. I know how it works. But if I, as Chris and I were just talking, if I wanted to use Keynote instead of PowerPoint and I can't remember what's the key, what's the shortcut for that, I have to figure out what do I do. Well, I, want, I can go in the menu, I can find out. I can go to help. What are the relative trade offs of going to help versus going to the menus and searching through menus, etc.? I'm engaged in metacognition about setting goals and planning. People enact tactics and strategies. Tactics are small, if-then kinds of operations. For undergraduates studying on paper textbooks, see something in italic, highlight it. That's a tactic. Not te terribly deep, but that's what they do. Strategies are more complicated arrangements where they're decision points that order and sequence those kinds of tactics. And self-regulated learners make adjustments to these things on the fly, little ones. I don't have to uh, I ha highlight everything that's in italics. I may highlight only particular things that are in italics. And what are those things? And then also, they adapt and make more major structural changes to the ways in which they go about tasks. You've all had this experience where you've been writing a paper, and you go, <coughs> or electronically, you just trash it and say, I've got to start over again. That's a major adaptation. Learners are agents. What this means is that they make the decisions. We like to think we're in control as instructors or authors or, pro or program developers. We're not. Learners can sometimes just completely obliterate what we intend. My favorite example is a study that we did uh, with Diane Jamison Knoll, who's now in our Center for Online and Distance Education. We asked people to study material and we gave them learning objectives. We asked them to look at the learning objectives. At the end of the study, we asked them if they looked at the learning objectives. They all said yes. Four people never looked at them and told us that they did. Now, I don't think they were lying. They just forgot. This is part of what is 
known as agency. They made a decision even though we instructed them to do something and they thought they did it, but they actually hadn't. And one of the other really important features about this is that agency is expressed throughout the learning task. And that's going to come back to be a major point and a critique I have about why we, how we do experiments. What are the sources of variance in self-regulated learning on the fly in real time as it's happening? One of them is, that pe is people's alertness to cues or conditions. People miss bits of information. Sometimes they're overloaded. Selecting particular operations is another source of, of variance. Some students rehearse information. All they do is say it over and over again. Other students try to create mental crutches, mnemonics, first letter mnemonics like Roy G. Biv, or sequential mnemonics. Um, well, Roy G. Biv is also a sequential mnemonics. A lot of people don't know that it records the wavelengths as well as the names of the colors of the spectrum. But people get to select these operations as they are working. Skill is also something that introduces variance into learning. Some people are more accomplished at some of these kinds of tactics and learning strategies than others. And the less accomplished you are, the less automated it is, the more you have to attend to what you're doing than to the information that you're trying to learn. Motivation. This is a list I generated for my uh, undergraduate class in instructional psychology. Um, it just collects together a variety of major theories of motivation that we should pay some attention to that create experience in what people learn. And contextual support. There's capacity about what people already know, and that stands against, for example, the cognitive load that the environment puts on people. So if I'm going too fast for you to take notes, that's going to create additional load. And if all of the words that I'm using are new to you, you're going to be in trouble. If you, however, are a cognitive psychologist, and you've heard me give this talk before, this is going to be a snap for you. And then there are affordances and resources in the environment. This is being recorded so that you could later go back and stop this and make a note that you want to do and thereby change the load that you're experiencing by stopping the input so you can generate some output. What's wrong with the classical experimental paradigm? Well, here's the statistical expression for what happens in generating a score, for instance, to a test item. There's some effect due to a treatment. That could be, for example, my use of, let's say, an advanced organizer at the lecture, or presenting a graphic as well as a textual presentation of, for instance, the law of supply and demand. There are some features that are part of you as a learner. These are the knowledge that you have, the skill that you have, that full list that I just presented in the preceding slide. And Statisticians don't think anything is certain other than that there is some random error. So there's always something that potentially changes what score you might get on a test item or a paper that we just don't understand. There are some other very important assumptions when we do analyses of data. The first is that the treatment is supposed to add or modify particular operations that operate on particular instances of information. So for example, as a textbook author, when I italicize terms, I intend something very particular to happen. That use of font style is my treatment, and I expect a particular operation to happen. Undergraduates highlight that, which means that when they go back to study that information, they will discriminate that highlight information from other information in the book. The particular information is what I italicized, and the operation has to do with discrimination and subsequent usually rehearsal. There's some bedrock assumptions. If a learner experiences a treatment, first, all of these background aptitudes, the things I had on the preceding slide, that are not part of the treatment, that is to say that I'm not ex ex expressly trying to influence, they have a constant effect throughout the experiment, throughout the time of the experiment. So if I'm running an hour-long experiment, all of your knowledge, skills, motivation, et cetera, don't change in that time course. Second, that the treatment effect is the same for every learner and for every instance of the information to which that treatment is supposed to be applied. So when I italicize something in an experiment, 
I assume that the basis on which people make discriminations is identical. Not that one person has one rule for deciding whether to highlight something and another person has another rule, and that another person is a little bit inattentive. The assumption is that all learners are doing exactly the same thing. It has to be that way because that's the hypothesis that you're testing. And finally, any other factor that affects your score on a test item or a paper or whatever the dependent variable is that I don't know about is randomly distributed. That means that if some one person is ill, another person is feeling great. If one person is a little bit inattentive, another person is very attentive. And that on average, these kinds of factors about which we don't know don't have any overall effect on the mean, the average score I would compute for students. In other words, they wash out. Those are assumptions. They underlie every so-called parametric statistical test that uses the linear model. That's like t-tests and ANOVAs and correlation coefficients and all that stuff. Well, there's some challenges to this. Are the aptitudes constant if learners regulate SRL? No. Agentic learners in the middle of a task, phase three, make some fine tune. Fine, they fine tune what they're doing. They realize that, for example, there's so many italicized terms in here, I'm, if I highlight everything, I'll go crazy. So I'm going to be more selective. That is changing something that is assumed by this statistical methodological approach, this paradigm, not to happen. So in phase one, learners can change the definition of the task. They define the tasks based on what I may provide them, but they bring their own interpretations to it. In phase two, they can have goals and plans that differ expressly from mine. So for example, back in that study that Diane Jamison Noel and I did, some learners just flashed that window that had the instructional objectives and put it away because they said, well, he told me I had to look at it. I looked at it, but they didn't read it. How would I know that? Well, if I had measured their reading rate and I had counted the number of words in that window, I would have a way of indexing the extent to which they actually attended to that information. Phase three, tactics and strategies are fine-tuned. I was mentioning that just a second ago. And phase four, right in the middle of this task, at minute 33, the learner may say, you know, this is just not working for me. I'm going to go back and start again and get this right. I'm going to change what I'm doing because I think I can do it better. This is what learners do when they exercise agency as self-regulating learners. They can't do any of this in an experiment if I analyze it, analyze the data in the old-fashioned way. The second is, uh, challenge is that the analyses that we do don't actually test the hypothesis that a particular cognitive operation applied to particular bits of information has certain effects. There are two problems here. One, this is taken from um, a very lovely article by Peter Molnar, Penn State, about, or I'm not sure how to pronounce this, ergodic, does anyone know? Ergodic? Um, in statistical physics, as I understand it, and particularly in relating to the uh, qualities of gases, it's not possible to know, if you know something about the gas as a whole, you can't know anything in particular about a specific element, atom, molecule, whatever it happens to be. And so consequently, means and variances and standard deviations, that's what these symbols are here, covariances and stuff, they describe things about groups, but not about any particular learner. Secondly, this quote from some people at the University of Amsterdam, what between subjects latent variable models do, that says I've got an experimental group and a control group, I've got a mean here and a mean here, and that mean is supposed to tell me something about a particular cognitive activity that those groups engaged in the experimental treatment but didn't in the control treatment. So what between subjects latent variable models do is specify sources of between subjects differences. But because they are silent with respect to the question of how individual scores are produced, they cannot be interpreted as posing any particular cognitive or motivational process as a causal force within a person. This is a psychological expression of those ergodic laws. When I know something about the group as a whole, the mean, that number may actually not be the score that any person in the group has gotten. And consequently, the, my attempts to try to interpret what's going on cognitively or motivationally inside a particular learner are not allowed. 
Challenge number three, the analyses that we do actually mask the connections between operations and informations. So I don't know which particular operation got applied to which particular information. I give you a 10 item multiple choice test. And how do I know which operation you applied to learn the information that gained you the correct answer to number one? And did you use the same one for number two, which you also got correct? I don't know in the classical experimental approach. What if I have two different units of information and the same operation is applied to one but not the other and you get one test item correct for the first bit of information but not the second? Why? It's not supposed to happen if we have regular laws. Well, it must be something random, but of course that's very unsatisfying. Here's another case. What if there are two different um, bits of units of information and different cognitive operations and you get the test items for both of these bits of information correct? Well, how did that happen? First of all, you're not supposed to be engaged in the second operation according to my treatment. But more importantly, I can't tell from your answer to the test item which operation you applied. I don't know if you used operation I for test item one or operation J. You did happen to get them right, but how do I know? And since I want to theorize about these operations, I'm, you know, it's a mystery. Number four, well, okay, so these things happen randomly and they don't happen very much, so we're okay. No, you're not. Suppose I have a treatment condition with two levels and we have students with prior knowledge at three different levels, near zero, some are lots. We also have, um, some learning tactics that these people know, but some of them are quite novice with these. Some of them are, have moderate levels of skill and others of them are expert. And we have motivation of four types. This is a particular issue of motivation called goal orientation. Um, mastery and performance, mastery oriented students want to understand things. Performance oriented students want to demonstrate their achievements to others. And there's some other um, filigree on this about whether they're approaching or avoiding these kinds of things. And we've got one unknown factor because there's always something that we don't know. And I'm going to say it's only at three levels and I hope that it's randomly distributed across the groups in my experiment. So now if I allow for 15 subjects or participants per cell, I need two times three times three times four times three or 216 cells times 15 people, 3,240 people participating in my experiment. I have never seen in the Journal of Educational Psychology an experiment with that many people, never. But because I'm a statistician, I hedge my bets a little bit. The problem with this is that, to speak technically, our models are misspecified. We do not take into account in the statistical analysis of our data factors that we know to affect the outcome of our data. And when you do that, not only are you on soft ground statistically, but you're on very soft ground interpretively. Together, all of these four challenges say experiments of the kinds that I was trained to do are great for one thing, telling the differences between groups, determining whether a treatment works on average, but it cannot tell me what you do or what you do or what you do, and that's what I want to know. So how are we going to do that? Let's extend the paradigm. Where does the model of self-regulating learning tell us to look? How can we operationalize cognition and motivation? And how can we develop a fuller account of this relationship between operations and the bits of information to which they're applied? So I say trace. And let me give you, I've given you an example of trace already, highlighting. Every time you highlight or underline, I can say with, I think, quite solid um, reliability that you've made a discrimination between the information you've highlighted and the information that you didn't. I don't know what standards you use to determine what you highlight and what you don't, but if I had lots of highlights, I might be able to figure that out. So what I want to do is find out, does this operation lead to, for instance, learning particular bits of information? So I want to investigate that for every person, for every bit of information that they apply. So what I need to do is identify bits of information a learner must know to succeed on the test or in the paper or the lab report or whatever the dependent variable is in my research. And I need to trace the operations that are applied to that information, things like highlighting, 
you, maybe you can see where this is going relative to end study. Things like tagging, things like making notes, things like linking notes together, things like unlinking notes, things like bookmarking a website. I'll have a longer list in a minute. Traces are what uh, are called accretion data, a very famous book published back in the uh, late 1960s on unobtrusive measures. We can learn lots of things not by having people necessarily do things that we ask them to do, but just by gathering information that they kind of leave behind as they do things. There are erosion measures. So if you want to find out what the most popular exhibits are at museums, find out where the floor is most scuffed and worn. If you want to find out what people are paying attention to, find out what they highlight. Those are illustrations of these kinds of unobtrusive measures. We get the information without enforcing much on the learner by way of what they do. Almost everybody highlights. So how do we do this? How can we trace searching? Well, clicking tags in the library. You've got a list of tags. You want to find out what items you've tagged with that. You click that tag. All you, it filters down just to those items. I've just got a trace of you were searching for information that you tagged with can't do. And how do I know what your standard was for picking that? Because the tag is labeled can't do. You created that label. I know what it means. Now I know how you were searching. Using search boxes. What are you looking for? The text that's in that search box gets recorded. Now I know exactly what you're saying. I can't remember what this is. I don't know what that constant's value is. I'll search for it. Now I have a trace of that. Monitoring. Highlighting text selections. I've talked about that already. One of the things in InStudy you can do is create a large list of tags. You saw some up on the display before. Can't do, can do, funny, etc. What these are telling me is these are standards you're using to monitor information for different purposes. I know what the standards are because you've generated the label for the tag. I know which bits of information you're applying the tag to because you select it, pull up the pop-up menu, pick your tag, there you go. Now I know how you are monitoring your information. Assembling, putting information together. This is how we generate our understanding of information. So when you group nodes in a concept map, that picture of the concept map I showed you had a dotted line around a bunch of nodes. When you make a group like that, you're saying these things all go together. They fit in a category. In the concept map, there's also a way you can label that category. If a learner does that, I know more about the fact just that, that they grouped it, but what the group means to them. Linking one note to another note. This is a simple operation in end study. You click a link button. You pick the note you want to link to. You click OK. Done. Now you've got a link between these two notes because they, for some reason, go together for you. Now I know that you have assembled the information in one note with the information in another note. Because I also have onset um, time markers, I can look at the number of words in the set note that you were linking to to know, was it just a quick decision, probably based on just the title? Or did you actually read some of that information because you spent longer with that window in focus as the frontmost window? How about rehearsing? Opening a note that you previously made tells me you're thinking that there's something that you need to review, at least, and then closing it and returning it. Now I know that you've rehearsed a bit of that information. Reusing a term that you created, for instance, a, a term unto itself, then you use it in a note, when you use a word, you are rehearsing its meaning. You can't use the word without understanding its meaning. Or if you do, you're just deluding yourself, but there might be some ways in which we could invent to discover that. And translating is another major operation that people do. Translating from text to figures or figures to mathematical expressions. And here's one way in which we can do that. If they're looking at a web page with a diagram and they write some text in a note, that's some translation. If we had had enough money, we would have had a, uh, an expression builder in our note tool so that they could have translated text into expressions. But alas, the grant ran out. So now that we have, now that we can get data, specific operations, I know they're searching, I know they're translating, I know they're assembling, applied to particular bits of information, how do we analyze that? We use what one label for this big, messy table is called a confusion matrix. <laughs> and you can see why. So what we want to do is, how do we examine if these things lead to achievement? So first we get some traces, and we observe instances where the particular operation I'm interested in examining is applied to a particular bit of information. 
in contrast to where some other operation is applied to a particular bit of information. So I'm looking for searching, but I see over here I might see, for instance, highlighting. And I look at whether the score on a task or a test item on a one to n, that could be a range of score scales or a set of se separate items, was positive. That is, was the bit of information learned? So if you highlighted a particular term and you can answer a test item about that term, my theory is upheld. Monitoring for bits of information helps people learn. If you highlight but you don't, my theory is challenged. If you did something else, but nonetheless you get that test item correct about that term, my theory is underspecified. I don't know exactly what you're doing, but it's working for you. And this could be a form of theory. This is a controversial cell. I'd like to think it's a theory upheld, but I'll admit that's iffy. And you can create various indices to tell you how good is your theory in a quantitative sense. I'll just leave that because that's a whole course unto itself. So what we want to do is infer that students are self-regulating their learning. And how do we infer that they're doing that? So when they generalize these true positives, so for example, under different conditions, do they apply the same operation to similar bits of information and achieve a score, like get one on a plus multiple choice item? When I see different conditions in the context of web browsers or different notes being opened or other kinds of these inf bits of information in the timestamp log, I can figure out what triggers a learner to engage in this particular operation. I can find out how they make choices to say, this is something I should highlight. I can also investigate their uh, control of variable strategy, that is the scientific method. Um, if I'm in a particular condition, and an operation that I apply to a particular bit of information fails me, I don't get that test item right, what can I do differently? And how do I know that they might do something differently? I wait for behavior to unfold, I look in the log and see what they do. And when I have a record that in the past, under condition A, they've done the same thing over and over and over again, and now they do something differently, they're figuring out, what can I do? That's self-regulation. So not only can I test theories directly about, for instance, does rehearsal promote learning? Does translating promote learning? I can investigate the ways in which learners are regulating the ways in which they apply those operations to information. And I can search for traces about in false negatives of operations. That is to say, if I'm in a particular condition and the learner does something other than what they had done before or what I'm hypothesizing, and they get it right, what other operations work? This would be a great source of information to feed back to learners saying, you didn't know that you were doing something that actually works. Let me show you what you were doing. How do we characterize strategies and structures of learning? Well, suppose this is a sequence of stuff in my log. These, each of these letters represents some trace, like selecting uh, highlighting some information, tagging that information, linking that information to something else. That could be A and B and C. You can make what's called a transition matrix. So first I did A, then I did B, put a tally here. Now I'm in state B, I did D, put a tally here. Cycle around that way, record exactly what goes on in this binary way, this conditional way. You can draw a nice picture of that. Describe the, the likelihoods of moving from one state to another. And I'm going to skip over a whole bunch of stuff here, just real fast, because this looks, oh, I don't want to say, we're not listening to iTunes here. Um, we can draw larger pictures of this that show us, are there patterns? Where are there partitions, the green structures? Where are there particular events? So for example, A, in relation to this, morphs into this structure in relation to exactly the same thing. And so this is what I'm going to skip. I'm going to just say we have a couple of formulas that we apply to this stuff. It's, it's out of graph theory. Um, those of you that may have encountered social network analysis will, may recognize some of these. But there are things that we can describe, for example, are these 
sequences of things patterned or are they more or less random? We can ask questions about, um, whoop, let me go back one. Um, if I have a graph for me on Monday and me on the following Monday, do I change or do I stay the same way? And we get an index ranging from 0 to 1 that tells us, in a sense, the geometric con congruence of these two graphs. And this thing is uh, structural equivalence is something about if I have a condition that leads to a particular operation or set of operations, and I have another condition that leads to the same set of operations, are those two conditions the same or different? And I can generate an index that lets me determine, for instance, how many different entry points are there to the learner using a particular strategy? Is there only one, or are there several of them? And how closely, in a functional way, are those different entry points to this strategy aligned? How do we realize this new paradigm? And this is the point that I have built up to by showing you the software, making a critique of experimentation, and saying that we can do some interesting quantitative work with the information that software like NStudy collects in this time-stamped time way. First, we have to massively expand the database. And then I want to show, talk a little bit about supporting learning, promoting learning and experiments, integrating learners into the research loop, and motivating academic work. I think these are five key steps to what's involved. First, massively expanding the database. How do we do this? Give everybody the software. Have them use it every day. Every subject, as they work, taking notes, reading, highlighting, reviewing, chatting, all of this activity generates data. Shove that all into a database. If we could get one grade 10 uh, subject, like social studies, in the province of British Columbia to use this software for a month, we would have very rough estimate as much data as is generated by all the educational psychologists in the world in a year. And it would have properties of, that would allow us to investigate in a much more penetrating way what's going on than the kinds of experiments that we typically do. Supporting learning, how do we do this? Some of the web pages you put up should be descriptions about tactics and strategies that people can use in the learning so they can consult. This gives them an opportunity to extend what they know how to do as learners how else can you support learning? With the data that NStudy collects, we can compute indexes that tell us, for instance, it might be a good idea for you to review this bit of information right now. This is based on old paradigmatic kinds of studies, but it's a start. And the beauty of this is that as learners do review and then we gather achievement data, we can refine that curve for them. So it becomes very individual rather than just this thing that seems to characterize um, first year university students in psychology labs. Promoting learning experiments. One of the features of NStudy that we, I hope to develop with a grant that my colleague John Nesbin and I have applied for is a query tool. How am I studying? Well, how would you answer that question? Well, that picture that had the colored sections is one way in which we could literally picture the ways in which learners are studying. And if we can overlay that with some information, for example, about this pattern of studying seems to be working really well for you in two ways. First, you hardly ever have to review that information. That is to say, you don't make choices to review that information. And even though you don't, you're doing pretty well on that content that you studied using that kind of tactic. But this tactic over here, you can fill out the rest of that story. If we can create a query tool like that, learners would be able to get feedback about not just how well they've done, but what they've done that led to how well they've done. And then in conjunction with this um, bunch of stuff for supporting learning, we can offer them alternatives, saying, if this strategy isn't working well for you, here's another one you could try. Where would we get that? Well, we integrate learners into the research loop. They become unpaid, hopefully willing, research assistants. They share data. We open up Facebook for NStudy or something like that so that I could say, Chris, I got a strategy that I know you're going to love. 
And Chris can say, I don't like it because that's, you know, what goes on in Facebook, those kinds of things. But all of this is data that we're collecting. We get information, for example, about why Chris doesn't think he likes it. We can look in his file and find out if he's ever encountered any of those conditions, like the student who said, I looked at the learning objectives, but I actually never did. We can feed back information to them so they can carry out, as self-regulating learners do, a personal program of research. But the software can support them in what they don't now have, which is the lab book of data and the analytical tools they need to understand the patterns in that data. And if we incorporate researchers, or sorry, learners into the research loop, they become their own researchers as self-regulating learners, and they'll, I'm certain, will invest, investigate kinds of things that I'll never think of, because all of the grade 10 students in British Columbia are just a lot more creative in the mass of mental power that they have than the, the people in my lab and that I am. And finally, how do we motivate everyday academic work? Part of the purpose for putting sharing tools into end study was to do that because learning is more fun when it's social, usually. But we can help motivate academic work by showing learners there are steps that you can take to accomplish the goals that you set. Here are the steps that you're taking that are working toward that for you. Here are steps that are not. Here's what's different about those steps. If you don't have some steps you can think of yourself, here are some others that you can try. Carry out a little program of experimentation. There's an important condition on this working. It is that teachers will let students do this. Now what I mean by that is you have to allow that sometimes, like all research, your experiments are going to fail or they're not going to achieve the results you expected them. Your hypothesis is not going to be confirmed.